So, yes, my name is Shiv Malik. And I was going to say that I was incredibly psyched to be here. Um, I mean, Radical Exchange in Detroit was probably the best conference I've ever been to in about half a decade. Um, who was there? Anyone? Yes, OK, a few people. So I was going to say I was psyched, super psyched about being here. Then my old boss showed up, and like just this morning, hi Julia, and he knows how much of a pretender I am. So now I've got like imposter syndrome writ large. And then I also woke up, and it seems like my body has imbibed every disease and virus going. So uh, if you value your life, do not approach me afterwards. Uh, I need to be quarantined like right now. Anyway. I still am super psyched. Um, so apart from being a disease-ridden imposter, who am I? It's a good question. Well, oh god, that slide. Um, I'm a former investigative journalist from The Guardian, uh, turned evangelist for a new data economy. That's me. I actually look worse. This is good. I've improved with age. This is nice. Uh, back in 2012, that was me on the news in the UK talking about how Facebook was turning us all into info slaves. That was the phrase I used then. I think it's probably better as info serfs. That's technically a better description. But no one knows what serfs are. No one does enough Russian history for the 19th century. Anyway, um, it was uh, all about Facebook's IPO. And, um, and, and my adversary in yellow is someone who was defending Facebook's business model and the joy it brought to the world. And apparently, she did that of her own free will. Oh, how times have changed. Um, anyway, I was angry then about Facebook. I don't know, I had just those issues. But that was before Facebook broke traditional media and actually nearly destroyed The Guardian, and with it, my dream job. And then I got super angry about Facebook. So I joined a group of developers. That was back in about late 2017 uh, from a project called Streamer. Uh, and after hassling them for a while, they ended up building uh, some underlying infrastructure as a side project, which potentially changes the data economy, at least I think, forever. It's pretty mind-blowing. What they've done is to make a thing called a data union. Uh, Glenn or Jaron might call it a mid, and we've had this discussion, as you've already sort of heard, to call it a data cooperative, a data trust, a data collective, a data fiduciary. Please, God, let's not call it a data fiduciary. Um, but those who, are familiar, who aren't familiar, what is a data union? Well, it, it's a way, perhaps I think the only way, of finally enabling individuals to own and control the data, uh, the most valuable asset of the 21st century, information. It might even take down Facebook which is great, because they say revenge is a dish best served cold. So I've already gone for the long view there. So let me give you a quick, like a quick and ridiculously simplified overview of the visions of the data economy that have pertained up till now. <coughs> Guys are already laughing. This is good. Um, over the last decade and a half, I think, um, there's been a lot of talk about a fairer data economy, right? So there's plenty of visions. The first one is the kind of open data vision. Um, are people familiar with this? Do I need to go over it? I'm just going to do it anyway. OK, so the ODA vision, is, uh, the open data vision is that, you know, companies, uh, governments all share their data, and it's all exchanged. Nothing is monetized um, in, in that sense, but it's all open for everyone. And, uh, you know, the open API banking movement, in a sense, came from those ideals. And it's backed by the ODI, which was started about seven and a half years ago by Tim Berners-Lee um, and his partner. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's spread as an ideal. The second group of people who have a vision about how the data future should look is uh, uh, the data economy should look is the kind of the privacy or death people, right? And th there'll be some of you in this room. Um, and they're kind of a very vociferous bunch. Um, at points, I've counted myself among them. Um, uh, and you know, the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation have been there. Um, and actually, they've been backed by tech, which has been great. So Firefox, DuckDuckGo, uh, encrypted acts like Telegram and WhatsApp, I think they're kind of inspired, especially Gen Z, who are very privacy aware now. 
Uh, even Apple and like even Facebook has tried to get in on the kind of privacy act in that sense. And then the final model, in a sense, or vision, is the ownership. And it's a model. I think it was the like, earliest ideal, but it's sort of fallen away, and it's making maybe a resurgence. Uh, and that's been led by people like Andrew um, Yang, the Democratic uh, presidential candidate, uh, people like Yuval Hariri, author of uh, Sapiens. Um, the musician Will I Am has written a piece saying, you know, in a sense, if we can own our music and copyright that, why not our data? It's kind of an odd bunch of people, and maybe, you know, without getting to the weeds of it, I'd kind of uh, add in Jaron and Glenn. Glenn, where are you? Yes. Maybe I'd add you into that taxonomy in a loose way. I'm sure you'd be like, no, resistant. But there we go. Um, I think that's the kind of general overview. But this is actually, this, despite all those visions, is actually what we've got. That's, that's the panopticon. Um, someone actually built it. That's really cool. Um, I should really find out more about that slide and where it came from. Uh, the panopticon, as you know, is, I think, Jeremy Bentham's uh, vision of how to run a prison, but it turns out also to be a vision, really, of how to run the world uh, uh, in a really horrible way. So you have a world of data oligarchs and data serfs. Don't worry, I'm not going to go over this for very long because we all know it in the room. Um, the data oligarchs obviously being... Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Netflix, et cetera, they sit here. And the ordinary people are the serfs. Hands up if you use the internet. Yes, hands up if you use the internet. Oh my god, it's like one person who doesn't use the internet. Well, anyway, everyone else, that's you, right? You already know this. Um, and the government's in on this too, right? NSA, Snowden. Uh, told us that this was happening. And I, was, I remember being in The Guardian um, when Snowden broke. And I didn't, wasn't part of the team that broke that story, but I was sitting literally right next to them. So it was incredibly exciting uh, to live vicariously uh, on that story. But you know, the day before, if you tried to tell anyone that the government was collecting all of your information and they could take your phone and listen to you without you even knowing about it, people think you're crazy. Like, they were like, here you go, have some foil, stick it on your head, you're nuts, right? The next day, after Snowden broke, people were like, yeah, obviously the, the government's collecting all your data and can listen to your phone. And you're like, and I remember in The Guardian, very distinctively, like, there's been no reckoning. There's been no bit in the middle where we're like, oh my God, this happened, and let's digest this, and where are the riots, and aren't, it's like, what happened? And I think it's taken all of this time, really, for people to, to ingest that information, the horror of actually what's gone on. And in many ways, I think the Ethereum movement has been a response to, directly to the Snowden uh, uh, revelations. So you can't trust the state, you can't trust big tech. I'm a cooperativist. It's so annoying because spell check doesn't recognize cooperatist at all. It's not a word, so you had to keep spelling it and again and again. That's how unpopular a term it is. Um, so I already came up, so from, from where I'm coming from in that sense, there's, I have an instinctive sense that power should reside in the hands of individuals. Um, but not just individuals, but individuals empowered to act collectively, right? Um, and therefore, the ownership model to me has always appealed. People own their data and they trade what they want. But what has bedeviled this vision of ownership is that enabling individuals to trade and own their data is a huge, it's a really, it's a huge technical problem. Did anyone, did anyone know what this is? Probably not. Why would you? It's kind of weird. So this is a guy from Chris Downs, right? This belongs to Chris Downs. And it's the, in, Chris, uh, in 2000, Chris Downs basically became the first person to overtly uh, download, download, he had to handwrite this, so download, all of his data and sell it. Do you know where he sold it? eBay. Do you know how much he got for it? $200. It's not bad, right? I mean, when he said all of his data, like all of his data that he could get. I mean, I don't think like that Facebook wasn't even around then. So he was the first guy who did it. And basically, until about a month and a half ago, we're still in the same position. Like, if you want to sell your data, where do you go as an individual, right? You go to eBay. And like, no one's, that's just not going to work, right? It's not going to work. It's not going to scale. And everyone in this room knows that. And everyone out of this room 
also knows that. So look, what are the issues here, right? To allow this to scale, what are the issues that you have to solve? First one is transport, right? You just need to literally transport data from one place to another, right? Uh, for the people who are sort of non-technical, not that I am myself, there hasn't been a way to simply get data from an API and then push it on behalf of an individual, right? You need a data, I mean, it is possible if you have special coding skills, but not in an easy way, right? So you need a data delivery network. It's the boring stuff. Like, you know, if you want cars and trains to work, you need roads and rails. And no one thinks like rails, are, the actual rails are like sexy and cool. Uh, and of course, corporations have built, them, built these things for themselves, but no one's come along and built them for individuals yet. So the second thing you need is discovery, right? You need to aggregate and discover that data. So you don't want to be that company who's the data buyer and going to eBay and trying to find 800 people or 8 million people and trying to download all their data. It's just like ridiculous, right? That's never going to happen. So you need one place where everyone's data is aggregated, and that's like a technical challenge, right? And then it's an easy place to discover it. So you need a marketplace, right? And a marketplace that allows you to literally just type in for what you're looking for as a data buyer and go, oh, wow. It's right here. And finally, people need to get paid, right? That doesn't, you're like, well, we've got money. What's the problem, Shiv? What's your big deal? This isn't an issue. And then you're like, well, no, no, no. We need to pay like a million people three cents each every couple of days, right? No bank will do that for you, right? And the fiat system just won't work for that. Crypto, as it exists at the moment, struggles with that too. You can't pay people in Ethereum for that much either. So what do you need to do? You need to develop a completely like, new micropayment system. Um, based on crypto, that's cool, but that's what you need to do. So you need all these three things to come together in order to create the basic generic infrastructure for individuals to be able to sell their data, right? OK, cool. We solved it. I didn't solve it. Some other guys did. I'm taking the credit on the stage now. That's nice. I like that. Um, so the streamer team happened to be at this sort of fascinating conjunction of real-time data and crypto. They had experience of, of all of those things. So they built the outline of both a decentralized, permissionless, end-to-end -end encrypted network, right? that transport layer for the information. And they also had a data marketplace for, di for discovery purposes. That's kind of cool. And they had experience with crypto, so they could build a micropayments service, which was technically described as kind of one-to-many payment service, right? So you just have the one buyer distributing to many other people. And that was actually much easier to build than like a generic kind of entire payment system, which is what everyone else is trying to do. We just had the one use case, so we could build it for that, in a sense, or the one payment pattern, I should say. So here's a technical outline of what's going on. And we call this system community products, but it's basically the generic infrastructure for building data unions. So it's a data unions builder, if you want. It's actually out in March uh, for anyone to use, but at the moment, we've already got people building on top of it, as you'll find out. So here's a technical, as I said, outline. The, this is really crude. Anyone's a developer is just going to be like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, <laughs> the data source is at one end, uh, and it travels through the decentralized uh, network, end-to-end -end encrypted, which I think is also really important. Uh, and this whole thing's built for real-time data, so it doesn't store data at the moment, but it also doesn't do static files and that kind of thing. It's not built for that. It's just built for real-time data, which is great. So it doesn't do everything, so it's not going to do your Experian files, but it will do your uh, API, open APIs and, and real-time data in that way. Um, then comes up to the other side, and there's a buyer on the other end who unlocks the data by paying for it in the specific token that we have called data token. And the whole thing is governed by a smart contract. Access to the data and then redistribution of the funds going the other way is all governed by a smart contract. Uh, I won't go into the details of what that is, but basically it means that it's a piece of code that's kept in the blockchain, therefore its state is pretty certain and can't be changed. Uh, and that means it's, uh, it's self-governing and effectively, or self-actioning. Uh, um, so that's the generic infrastructure. 
So uh, along came a team about nine months ago, and they're like, hey, this is cool. We can make some money from this. Uh, and I think it's also something that we really want to do. Um, they built an app called Swash. We're going to see this in a second. Uh, and um, they're from the Middle East. That's what I was going to say. Uh, they're based in Turkey. Uh, and they saw what they thought was a really, as I said, that kind of opportunity. So what is Swash? Well, it's a browser plugin or extension that works in both in Chrome, in Firefox, and Microsoft Edge. Does anyone use Microsoft Edge? No? Yes? Yeah? Yes! Yeah, of course, Glenn! Oh my god, now I'm really embarrassed. Uh, you still use Chrome, though, don't you? Uh, um, no, um, users send their data direct from over here to the network. That's really important. So it's not the centralized app owner who sends the data. The, the individual application, the, app, uh, the people who use the app send it direct to the network, not to someone else who then passes it on. And that's, that's an important uh, aspect to all of this from a technical perspective. It means it's, it is actually pretty decentralized. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and that's bundled into one product on the marketplace. Uh, and when the payment happens, the app builders can take, according to the smart contract, up to a percentage of 30%. We just fixed that basically as an arbitrary number, but that seemed about right. So they can go up to 30%. They've actually decided to take 5% of all the transactions that occur at this end. And the rest of it is automatically, actually all of it's automatically redistributed to then the app builder at 5% and then everyone else. And that's really important too, because it means again, you don't have this centralized person who says, okay, well, we'll distribute the payments in this way. It's done by a smart contract. So important. Okay. And that's, by the way, also how they generate revenue for themselves, the app builders, and I think that's really important. All of this starts to look maybe a bit like a mid, right? And I didn't know that that's what we were building until I think Glenn passed me his paper, um, the one from September last year, uh, 2018, in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, and I was like, oh my god, this is what, we're building like a simplified version of a mid without all the other fancy governance elements to it, but those are coming. Anyway, let's go see it. Okay, so this is the website, 10 minutes. Okay, that is not enough time. Faster, Shiv, faster. Um, swashapp.io, if you wanna look it up. Um, it, as I said, it's their website, so that's cool. I'm gonna flip out of this, and let's see if we can do this. Okay, so quickly, five minutes. Here's their website. All you have to do is download it. It doesn't work on mobiles. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, all these people disappointed at the front. They're like, ah, oh, that sucks, Shiv. Why do you tell us to like go to the website? I've only got my mobile. Um, <clears throat> so it's a browser plugin for your laptop, right? Uh, there, are, there is a mobile version coming, and in fact, uh, there are other apps coming that do different things from this. So this is just the first, right? And as I said, we didn't build this. You can't see anything. Great. <laughs> Look, let's just go there instead. That looks cool. Um, hang on. I always forget to do this. Ta-da! Okay, thanks for telling me. I could have done. I could have gone on forever. Okay, actually, that's a bad idea. Let me just do this. Give me a second. So this is the website. As I said, there's there's other things coming. It's a browser plugin. So get Swash, and then it appears in your browser just like that as an extension would. At the moment, it's registering zero. There's a little bit of a bug. It's not out yet fully. But uh, it takes a bit of time for it to sync with the blockchain, basically. And sometimes you need to restart the browser. But that gives you your data. Uh, it tells you how much you've been earning. Hang on. So let me just go up to the top here. So there, you'll find your earnings. And this morning, I think, or just before I got on stage, obviously, it's a live demo, so something's gone wrong already. Um, that was at 16 data, which actually equivalent to about 16 cents at this point. We'll get into the payments later, maybe in questions. Um, but as you can see, you have your own wallet address, so it just spins that up automatically and a private key. These things aren't hard to do. Then, this is the really interesting part, right? You can choose which data to capture. So obviously, it's a browser plugin, so it's capturing all of your habits, or it can capture all of your habits if you want. Um, um, but they've built specific modules to capture specific behaviors because that's the kind of data that's valuable to data buyers. So you've got 
uh, modules for Amazon, Facebook, Search. Um, let's just click on the Amazon so you can actually select exactly what you want to send. This is really important because like, your, it's your data, right? treating people as if it is actually their data, right? Why not? It's a novel concept. And you can just choose what you want to send to this data union to be sold. OK, there's similar stuff for all of these other modules. This is, I really like this. This is the privacy slider. So like, if you have it on low, let's just blow that up for the sake of the screen. Um, it'll send all of this information, right? The whole full URL, uh, the, all the text stuff, right? Your user ID info, your name. But that's if you've got it on low. If you've got it to medium, then it starts to mask certain elements of that stuff. And this is the, st I like this bit. I'm just going to dig in on that, which is the user ID. It gives you a random, gen randomly generated user ID, which it switches out every so often. So you can't, if you're the data buyer at the other end, you can't target individuals. You can't really figure out. So it's all, the, all about anonymizing the individuals, but creating a data set that in aggregate is actually worth something and gives you decent insights, right? Um, and if you have it on high, then that's all the kind of data you'll be sending. There are other elements to this as well. So let's just see if we do this. Uh, I love Reddit calls. Exchange. I really do. I spelled that wrong, obviously. Um, there we go. So you've already generated data that's going to be sent to the union in two minutes. I can delay that further in three. Or and you can inspect the kind of information that is being sent. That's the kind of stuff. There's a few, you're right, and there's a duplication on certain things. We won't get into that. Or I can just say zero. OK, let me just show you. Yeah, we're going to come to questions in one second. Here's the marketplace where you can discover all of this. Uh, Jen's like, Shiv, you've really gone over time. Um, so that's what it looks like when you go to purchase it on our marketplace as a buyer. And this is the data fire hose that comes through. If you purchase it, and you can see, this has now got 500 users. So there's 500 people out there who've already downloaded this and are producing this data right now, like right now, uh, as part of a data union. Is it useful data? Yeah. Uh, we can get to that in questions, perhaps, about how much it's worth, because it's actually worth a lot of money, because no one else really has this data in the world, and certainly not in real time. And that's a function of being a data union. You can get at things in this very specific way. OK, um, I think I'm going to leave it there. I hope that points out some of the very interesting things of a data union. It's all very exciting. <laughs> Have we got five minutes for questions? Yeah, great. Thank you, Shiv. Um, so again, not much time for questions, but we want to open this up for discussion, statements, whatever you want to asked or say. I think there's a guy over there and a guy over there. I see a way here to generate some garbage data. Like I just make some bot that generates like tons of garbage data and yeah. I get the rewards for this and but this is garbage, completely irrelevant data. So <laughs> that's a really good point. And actually, on day three, it was amazing. We had bots on this system on day three. Uh, how they found us, how they knew. I mean, us, like the, the team, right? But um, uh, there are, I mean, it was the first thing that we thought about. So there's two ways out of this. The first one is when you do something like this, then you just need to worry about, uh, you need identity solutions. Um, they, the team are building them, and there's back-end stuff that we're building uh, as a generic thing, so you can kick users off, right? The tooling to be able to kick specific users off. Um, you're always going to be fighting bot wars, in a sense, as they get better. right? So that is, you're right, uh, a problem. Um, but then the other thing is that if you do this with subscription platforms, like Netflix, right? you can start to imagine Netflix becoming a mid. Right? You don't need to steal Netflix's data, in a sense, or take it back. Right? They could integrate all of this stuff and revenue share with their customers. Um, but it's
data set. Uh, and that's, in effect, what you're doing. If you want to stop other people from buying it, what we're, so we're building tools that allows you, because it's actually pretty easy. You just have to have a permissioned key, and then only those people can buy that data. And that allows for a certain KYC to who buys your data. And that's, that's kind of cool. But then that's up to the mid, isn't it, right? And this is where it gets really interesting, because you end up with elements of governance. Like, what does that mid want to do? Only give it to governments, uh, only give it to researchers, only give it to or non-profits, or whatever it might be. Only give it to profitable companies, right? Um, it gets fun. It gets fun. Time for one more, maybe? Is there one more? Can I go and die in a corner? Yes. OK, go. <laughs> Hi, um, can you see like a um, scenario maybe in the future where colleges buy uh, students' data to, to accept students to the colleges? So uh, in a sense, are you getting at sort of conflicts of interests there, right? So uh, people are, I mean, I think may maybe the question is, uh, is this, which is, will people become more wary about what they sell? So colleges can probably already do this, right? They can already buy information, maybe not about the particular student who's coming, but probably about the generic student that they're about to interview and their background and be able to predict habits from what that student will do. Um, if not the particular one, right? You can probably you can buy in certain instances that sort of stuff like their credit worthiness. So they can already do this already. So I'm not so worried that if you can already do it, then maybe you can already do it on this system. I'm more worried, I, and I think the advantage is that people out there can say, look, I'm not going to give this information away because suddenly I'm being paid for it, so I realize it's mine and it's worth something, and that ownership means responsibility. And I think that's, that's a much better system than what we have now, which is basically everyone walking around like this going, yeah, I'm going to send email, I'm going to you know, go on Twitter and Facebook, and I'm just going to close my eyes to the tyranny of terms and conditions. Right? And I, you know, what's going on in the background is what's going on in the background. OK. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It's a real honor to be here.